Marcello Musto anymore. He was already presented, I think, several times. Um, uh, yesterday, we also presented, let's say, two books. Uh, at least, and uh, about Marx. I also very uh, happy and proud that this is the Rosa Luxemburg lecture, because um, uh, Peter is here somewhere. Peter Judis. Ah, yeah, you are here uh, editing the works of Rosa Luxemburg in 17 volumes now in English. Um, and luckily, there are a lot of new manuscripts of Rosa Luxemburg found on economics, but also on the Polish question and Polish language. So the work to publish her work is going, going on. And to everybody who has not yet read the letters, especially the love letters or the letters from the prison of Rosa Luxemburg, should do it immediately. This is great literature, and you see how she combined to be a great revolutionary, but also a very, very special person. So, it's an honor to give Marcello the floor. Please. Um, good afternoon once again. <clears throat> Thanks to Mikkel. And once again, very, very sincerely, uh, my congratulations to the organizer for <clears throat> putting together such a big event. I am also a little organizer, and sometimes I don't like when we invite professors, especially from North America. They believe that everything is granted for them. They never, uh, often, they don't <coughs> thank for the work that uh, has been done. And actually there are, as Michael told us, Michael Bree told us in, uh, before his presentation, we know that there are dozens of people beyond the work that you have been doing, and uh, hopefully the work that we will <coughs> be doing together in the next years. So I was very stimulated by many uh, presentations that I heard in the past days, in particular today. So in the end, I decided to include some more topics in my presentation. And um, I hope that this is not going to turn into a too um, superficial and uh, problematic and long talk. I also wanted to ask Professor Desai if he could give me your uh, clock. So now the clock is gone. <laughs> take this, Marcello, take this. Hmm? So I will keep an eye on it. Hmm? Not all Neapolitans don't return. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Clock. <clears throat> so what am I going to do is uh, I'm going to trying to say something about Marx's conception of um, communism, post-capitalist society, because again, I was very stimulated. And then I will go to a second topic, which is the dialectical function of capitalism, which is very important for me to understand the position of Marx. And then I will focus on uh, the last um, years, the last decade, in particular, the last four or five years, in relation to this topic of uh, communism, socialism, but always looking at the, the role of capitalism for the um, communist society. Um. <clears throat> so there were basically three big umbrellas under which we can put uh, pre-Marxian socialism. And one of these are the thinkers who believe that it was very relevant to discover, to find a new system a new theoretical system for socialism. People like, for example, Sam Simon, they believe that if a system is created, is invented, then the workers, or actually at the time, the people will follow and will build the new society. The second big umbrella is the absolute equality. Like many of the socialists and communists before Marx, and actually also after, believed that we have to live in communism under strictly equal circumstances. Like we should all dress the same, we should all eat the same amount of food. And the third umbrella, the third group under which you can categorize very superficially what uh, existed before Marx, are those who created some experiments the, the phalansteries, for example, of Fourier, theoretically, but also many communes, like the one that were made by Cabet, uh, who went to the United States after 1848, or you all know the cooperatives of uh, um, 
Robert Owen. So Marx had a lot of respect for some of these thinkers, but he was extremely skeptical about the sectarian continuation of these ideas. And the skepticism of Marx was particularly strong with relation to one issue, the fact that all of them, most of them, almost all of them, believed that the working class could not emancipate themselves, that the workers always needed somebody to indicate them what to do. Now, as you know, Marx said that he never indicated the socialist system in the notes to Wagner, Adolf Wagner, or that he did not want to write something about the recipe for, uh, recipe for the cooking of the future. But it is also true that Marx left some indication about communist society in his work. And in my opinion, he left this indication in three kinds of writings. The first are the writings in which Marx wrote against the other socialism, what he considered wrong, uh, Michael Brie again said something about it yesterday, wrong socialism. Actually, these were the few times where Marx published some things, with the exception of capital. So where he felt in the need of saying to the working class, this idea is wrong, this socialist option is wrong. So you will find something like this in the German ideology, in the Communist Manifesto, in the Grundrisse against Proudhon, in the polemic against La Salle, of, like the critique of the Gotha program, and in other places. Marx also wrote, and this is the second group, texts for political propaganda of parties, union, organizations that exist at the time, in particular for the international. And you will find some indication about the communist society, because this organization, these activists, militant, they needed to know. So Marx provided some indication. But the most important indications for me about communist society you will find in the critique of political economy, in Capital, in preparatory manuscripts of Capital, in particular in the Grundrisse, where Marx is writing against capitalism, but at the same time he is developing some ideas about at least what communist society should not have, uh, should not have uh, how communist society should not be. Unfortunately, in a lot of books written on communism, on Marx's ideas on post-capitalist society, there are many references to his early writings the Communist uh, Manifesto, the EPM of 1844, where Marx wrote that communism was the negation of the negation or the moment of the Hegelian dialectic, or the famous sentence of the German ideology where Marx and Engels wrote that in socialism you will find a society different from the division of labor of capitalism in which you will fish in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, and criticize after dinner. Now we know that all these sentences cannot, actually, if you were a good reader of Marx, you knew it already from before, but all these references to Marx's ideas of communism with this kind of text, some of them written by a very, very early, very, very young author, some of them fabricated into a text, like the few words that Marx added to criticize Engels, criticize after dinner or being a critic, cannot be the idea uh, cannot be the representation of Marx communist society. And the same with the Communist Manifesto. If you read the 10 points of the Communist Manifesto, you will find several points that Marx overcome later. One of them, for example, is the idea that the abolition of all rights of inheritance, this was a very strong polemic that Marx had against Bakunin, who was retaking the San Simonian position within the international. So I'm going to go now to the next point, unfortunately very briefly, which is the importance of the development of capitalism for the communist society. Um, already in uh, the uh, writing wages, the preparatory manuscript of 1847, you see that Marx said that there is a positive aspect of capital. And you all know, I'm not reading this quotation about the Communist Manifesto, that are very familiar to all of us. You know that Marx wrote this famous article on India, in 1853, the future result of British rule in India, and Marx is saying that there is a double mission of capitalism, one is positive. There is also a very nice speech that Marx gave in 1856 uh, on the anniversary of the newspaper, the People's Paper, and Marx said, actually, the 
development of the steam, electricity, and the self-acting mule will be more important than, for the revolution than the political action of Barbet, Raspail, and Blanqui, who were three famous revolutionaries at the time. So Marx is saying the development is the most important thing. And there are also sentences in the Grundrisse that are very similar to Communist Manifesto and to the article of New York uh, Daily Tribune of 1853. Obviously, Marx is always aware of the, I'm quoting, usurper side of capital and that the fact that the free time created by capital was just to make workers do more work. But there is also a positive side for Marx. The great civilizing influence of capital is production of a stage of society in comparison to which all earlier ones appear as a mere local development of humanity and as nature idolatry. If you look at capital, because I have no time, you will see that Marx is mentioning six important points, in particular that we have with the concentration of capital, and these points are cooperative labor process, scientific technological contribution to production, appropriation of the forces of nature by production, creation of machinery that workers only can operate in common, the economizing of all means of production, and the tendency to creation of the world market. These six points are important for Marx. Obviously, they play a negative role, a role of misery, oppression, slavery, degradation, and exploitation, but they can also open a possibility for extraordinary growth of the productive forces that can be used by the struggle of the working class, can be used, not automatically, in order to expand the development of the individual. So Marx wrote in the Capital that Fanatically bent on making values expand itself, the capitalist ruthlessly forces the human race to produce production's sake. Um, he thus forces the development of the productive power of society and creates those material conditions which alone can form the real basis of a higher form of society. And now there is a definition of communism, a society in which the, fee and the full and free development of every individual forms the ruling principle. I'm skipping other quotations, but I want to say that you will find this kind of ideas also in other political writings written after capital. And you will find that, for example, capitalism is playing a positive role for uh, um, women's emancipation and for the organization of the domestic sphere against patriarchy. you find this in the international and in capital. I'm not reading the quotation. And you find in all the main political writings of the late Marx, in the critique of the Gotha program, Marx is writing in proportion, uh, in order to do a revolution, in proportion as labor developed socially, poverty and destruction develops among the workers and wealth and culture among the non-workers. Um, you also see that uh, when he's writing the critical notes about Bakunin, he says that it is only possible um, to have a social revolution where alongside capitalist production, the industrial proletariat accounts for at least a significant mass of people. So my thesis here is that Marx from the early 40s to the end of his life in his political intervention and in the elaboration of capital is um, saying that the productive growth of capitalism uh, generates the precondition for the communist society for which the workers movement was called upon the struggle. Now what is very important for me is to read the elaboration of the last Marx, in particular this kind of elaboration, to see that the research that he conduced in the last years of his life helped him to avoid the mechanic, dogmatic, economicistic approach that unfortunately was very strong in many Marxists, for starting from the Second International and then inside the communist movement. But before going to this, before going to the transitional points and to the debate of the last Marx, I wanted to open a short parenthesis about a couple of topics that have been debated in the past session. And I wanted to clarify what Marx did, or at least what are the few things, uh, few of the many things that he did in the last decade of his life. 
First of all, Marx is opening new horizons of life. So it is not true that he did not do any kind of research, and on the contrary, he started to research on new disciplines. And uh, Marx is trying to update his knowledge about the discipline in which there was a very strong scientific development and progress in those years. For example, Marx is studying a lot of geology. Why is doing this? Because it was useful for industrial agriculture, chemistry, physiology, the studies of 1876, agronomy, botanic, Quaisite already told us a little bit about it, so I can skip this part. New Horizons. Marx is also working on the pre-capitalist societies, in particular about the issue of common land ownership. Marx is very interested in this. And with the book of Kowalewski, Marx is observing and taking notes in particular about three points. The intervention of the Spanish in the Americas, the intervention of British in India, and the intervention of French people in Algeria. And Marx is strongly criticizing this kind of intervention. And Marx is strongly criticizing the destruction of the commune forms of uh, uh, production, ownership, and organization that exists there. Both Marx and Kowalewski are therefore writing clear statement and violent statement about, against colonialism, but very interestingly, Marx, who was a friend of Kowalewski and had an high esteem for his scientific friend, is also criticizing in some point Kowalewski for importing into the non-European context like, for example, India, European categories. And Marx is saying, dear Kowalewski, if you have this kind of phenomenon, like Comendatio, for example, it does not mean that in India there is feudalism. So Marx is very, very careful in his analysis and to make distinction. Marx is also, third point, returning to history. Marx prepared 200 uh, um, notes, 200 pages notes on Indian history from 664 to 1858, to the end of the Sepoy Revolt. And there is a very careful analysis of Indian history, much more depth than the analysis that he could do at the age of 34, 35, when he wrote his article in 1853. Marx is also writing a very big chronology of history, 16 centuries. Literally, Marx is dying while he's writing this chronology. And it's interesting to see that Marx is not only doing a chronology of the main economic um, events, but is also taking into account the role of the state and the importance of politics. Like he's criticizing the colonial intervention calling British dogs or the hypocrisy from uh, England. So these are the kind of uh, comments that you will find there. Marx is also writing about history every time that he can. For example, in the very relevant for me notes uh, on the manual of um, uh, Adolf Wagner, Marx is saying, look what this Wagner is saying. Wagner's, Wagner is arguing, I'm quoting, that Aristotle was wrong because he considered slavery non-transitional. But Wagner also wrote Marx was wrong because he considered capital, capitalism transitional. So in this text, there is the old polemic that Marx already started in the early 40s when he's saying that the most important thing, also for political reason, the working class is to consider capitalism an historical mode of production. But Marx is not only writing and studying books, as we said yesterday during the debate about the biography, Marx is also reading newspaper and any kind of possible things. So there are these very nice uh, um, letters, and one of these, uh, Michael, is written by Jenny, the daughter of Marx, mm -hmm. and uh, the husband of Jenny said, can you send me back this newspaper with the article? And Jenny said, I'm so embarrassed, I'm sorry, but my father uh, saw the newspaper, and every time that dad is taking something, it's full of blue notes with pencil, pen, etc., that it's impossible to read. He's the only one who can read this. So this is the sort of voracity that Marx had when it was about learning more. I also wanted to make a point about about Capital, the second volume of Capital, the second book of Capital. Why Marx could not publish this? This is in relation with what happens in the last uh, part of his life. Obviously, there is a second draft, 68, 70. Marx is making progress compared to the draft of 63, 65. But in this period, 
In particular, between 77 and 81, there is a very strong battle between Marx and capital. And Marx is trying once again to do new studies very focused on political economy. Marx is studying banks. Marx is studying monetary system. Marx is studying the crisis that started the economic industrial crisis in 1873. Marx is studying Russia like a crazy. Marx learned Russian in 1869 instead of writing the second book of Capital. And I can tell you once again a story because it's late and you are all tired, but there is Jenny von Westphalen, Marx's wife, that see this friend of Marx, Danielson, who later will be the translator of Capital, full of books, full of Russian books, full of statistics. And this is on Sunday because every Sunday they conglomerate with friends and comrades. And Jenny look at uh, Danielson and say, Next time that you enter in this house with some Russian books, you will never, never participate to our lunch. I'm not going to feed you because you will make my husband crazy. And this is the same expectation, the same reaction that Engels had every time he opened the door of Marx's room with the hope that there was an improvement. And actually, Marx was full of Russian statistics. And if you read the testimony of Lafarge, Engels said, I hate you and your Russian books. But why Marx is doing this? Why Marx is paying so much attention to Russia? Why Marx is paying so much attention to the United States? Because he's asking Sorge and the old friends of the international to send him statistics, statistics, new materials. It's a very analytical research, very different from the idea Marx is writing with Hegel books in his hand, <laughs> trying to reproduce Hegel logic. Marx is looking for material that will give him more information, concrete information about the development of capitalism in new societies. That's why he's studying Ohio statistics. And this society is very important for Marx because, for example, in the case of California, he's writing, in this part of the United States, there are economic processes that happen in a few years, and this economic process took decades to develop in England. So Marx is thinking about this, how important and just make an example how the development of railway was very important for the centralization of capital. But all these new studies, all these new phenomena, all these new things deserved a lot of time to be development. And going back to biography, life and ideas, deserved a body who could work, deserved a healthy person. And Marx was not at the time. So the problem with the book two of Capital is no longer a problem of some missing parts. It's no longer a problem of rewriting stylistically in the way that Marx loved some of the old manuscripts. But it's mostly a problem related to reconsidering old ideas about crisis, about credit, about role of the state, about the rent, which is related to the study that he was doing with agronomy, etc. So Capital One had England as a scenario. Capital too, Marx was very concern, um, convinced that he should expand the theater of the representation of capital, expand to Russia, expand to the United States in particular, and this required a lot of work, work that he was not in the condition, in the physical condition to do. I also want to say, going toward the end, at least I'm done 60%, but you will call me. I still have a little still bit of time, nine right? Still nine minutes. Very nine good. Minutes left. Well, you don't know how many pages I have here, but I will try to use a lot. So the political intervention of Marx in this period. Marx is very much involved in the struggle within the SPD, within the, what we will call the German Social Democracy, that is another name, the Socialist uh, Party of the German Workers. Um, Marx is fighting with the same political of 40 years before, when people like During, when people like Hochberg entered in the party, they said that they were going to lead the working class to new ideas. And Marx said, this is unacceptable for us. This is the idea that I've been fighting for all my life. I am in favor of self-emancipation. Marx is also very involved in political issue on international scale, supporting, for example, Turkey in the war against Russia, supporting, for example, Polish national independence. So he's always always against this counter-revolutionary Russia that has a presence so strong in Europe when there is an emancipatory movement. Marx is very uh, strong, has a very strong disillusionment about the British working class. I have no time to talk about this, but I want to say something about Marx's involvement in the new French Socialist Party. Marx wrote the program of this party, the electoral program of this party, which is, my opinion, is a very brilliant piece 
that is much more important than the 10 points that the young Marx wrote in 1848 in the Communist Manifesto. You read there that, for example, emancipation is possible only without discrimination of gender and race, 1881. And Marx is also trying to produce the blue books. So Marx wrote about England, and in England there were these reports about the factories. Now he's asking to his friends to get statistics and books from Russia or from the United States. But Marx is also trying to produce this material by themselves. The working class should do it. So Marx is writing a questionnaire for the workers, 101 questions, and which was the old idea that he had when he was in the international. And he say, let's try to get the information about ourselves. And he's also trying to create a sort of class consciousness about the exploitative modus operandi of capitalism. The workers read this and they will understand. Going back to capitalism is a necessary point of trans transition, Grundrisse, or theory of surplus value, capitalism, the prospect opens up for a new society, a new economic formation of society to which the bourgeoisie mode of production is only a transition. So, Marx did not take this idea in a rigid, dogmatic way. And the most famous example to prove this is the debate with Russia. Marx is receiving two um, uh, possibilities of intervention from Russia. One in 1877, in response to a review of Mikhailovsky to Capital, and one four years after, in response to Vera Zasulich's letter. This uh, um, um, request to Marx was very um, considered in, uh, in uh, Russia. Capital was translated there, the third country after Germany and uh, France. Well, they were asking this essential question to Marx, whether or not Russia could skip capitalism and could jump from a pre-capitalistic mode of production directly into socialism. And these two persons, Mikhailovsky and Zasulich, were saying, well, Actually, Mikhailovsky said all the followers, uh, Zasulich said all the Marxists are saying that we have to have capitalism. It's impossible to skip capitalism. And Mikhailovsky said actually Marx wrote this himself in Capital. So Marx wrote some letters, some Marx wrote several drafts, some of them were uh, not published. Marx decided to publish only a very short response to Vera Zasulich, in which basically is using the French edition of 1872-75, and it's saying that his ideas about the um, expropriation of agricultural producer, these ideas about the uh, dissolution of the economic structure of feudal society is something related merely to England and to European Western society. It is not a scheme that can be applied to every circumstances, to every period, and to every different country in the world. And the same with Vera Zasulich, with Obshina. Marx repeated that he had expressly restricted the historical inevitability of the passage from feudalism to capitalism to countries of Western Europe. You understand that this is a very serious elaboration and you cannot simplify Marx just quoting a few lines from a newspaper article published in 1853. By the way, in this letter Marx is going back to India and Marx is saying in the draft of Vera Zasulich, who in this place, besides the stupid anthropologists, liberal anthropologists, believe that capitalism has produced in India something else than more charities and more destruction. So there is a very strong critique against capitalism. So to overview what was Marx's elaboration to Zasulich and Mikhailovsky, Marx is against, uh, Marx did not exclude the possibility that the rural commune would break up but not because it was a sort of historical predestination. At the same time, Marx says that it's possible to have a coexistence of rural commune with some more advanced economic forms. So he's saying, quotation, the peasantry can thus incorporate the positive acquisition devised by capitalist system without passing through its Caudine forks. Marx is also not thinking that this obscena is the form of socialism, is the form of emancipation. So I'm very suspicious by these ideas that the late Marx changed all these ideas, changed his mind about everything, and he became a sort of new Herzen, believing that the obscene in Russia is the new form of socialism. Marx is always in favor of individual development. Marx is criticizing the isolation of this uh, um, obscena, and Marx is saying that obviously there need... Uh, 
there is the need of a, a social production and a new political form of organization of this obscena. And Marx is also taking, is learning another lesson after the one in 1879 by the Common of Paris, now he's learning the lesson by Russian populists who said, it is possible, it is achievable. So the political will and the favorable set of historical circumstances are important for Marx, are playing a role for Marx. Marx is not only learning from books, but he's also learning for the social movement, to the political circumstances. This is why in the Communist Manifesto, Professor of 1882, you read that can the Russian obscene pass directly to the higher form of communist uh, common ownership? And the answer is, the only answer possible today is this. If the Russian Revolution becomes the signal for a proletarian revolution in the West, so that the two complement each other, the present Russian common ownership of land may serve as a starting point for communist development. So final consideration. You have to understand this kind of things. Um, Marx could not come about through a fixed sequence of predefined stages. The idea that he had in the preface of 1859, Asiatic mode of production, feudal mode of production, bourgeois and communism is something that you cannot take into account here. And also the preface of 1867 is a mistake. Marx is no longer thinking that, you know, the most developed country is showing the rule that every country has to pass. Also, Marx denied that the development of the capitalist mode of production was a historical inevitability in any part of the world. Uh, Marx's uh, consideration of the future of the obscena are poles apart from the equation that socialism is, socialism is the development of productive forces. It's not like this, Koisaito told us today, the ecological uh, part of the obscena as well. Marx is now more flexible about considering the eruption revolutionary events. It is no longer um, linked to this idea that there must be all this prerequisite. Marx is in favor of a multilinear conception, a conception that he already developed between 57 and 67, the Grundrisse and Capital, and the conception on which he came back in this period, 77, 81, but he was not able to finish, he was not able to write, he was not able to develop in full this idea. And finally, Marx is guided by hostility toward past schematism and new dogmatism that were born in his name, the new Marxists. People said, I'm a Marxist, therefore capitalism should follow this route everywhere all the time. So, to uh, can you hear me? So, it's not me. It's yes. Not me. I just wanted to say that this Marx is very useful. I had a very scenic ending, but I will not do it. This Marx is very useful not only for the answers that he provides, but also, and perhaps in particular, for the young generation, for his style of thinking, for his style of learning, which is full of doubts, which is full of self-criticism. So we can perhaps say two considerations. Number one, there is still a lot to learn from Marx, and it's not true that everything about Marx has been already said and written. And the second point is that we can no longer learn from Marx's answer, but perhaps in some cases we can learn even more from Marx's questions and doubts. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, you are one minute over, so we, you know the Germans are bound to, to, to rules and we are abiding the rules too much. No, no, great, thank you very much and especially I think the, the end to really to prove that, he, that Marx was really uh, uh, started a long, long time um, uh, um, search process, I think this is very important. Yeah? Never to be satisfied with the answers you have find. You sh we are going forward asking. This is a Zapatista, as I said. I think said it. Yeah? We are look going forward asking ourselves all the time. This is the way the emancipative forces should work. So, the floor is open. Please, Peter. Yes, the micro, please. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, just a quick question. Um, 
You mentioned Marx's outline of world history that he made at the very end of his life, the outline of world history. Um, this has not been available in English except in very small sections. Um, it is available in Chinese. It was published in full. It's about over a thousand pages long. I'm curious who else or where else this has been published. Is it available in German? The entirety of it, the thousand page outline of world history? Um, if not, why not? Why has it taken so long for this to be made available to a Western audience when it clearly has been around long enough and known well enough for the Chinese scholars to do it? And it's to their credit that they did so. I've had a chance to look at some of this outline of world history, the small parts that were made available, uh, and they're quite fascinating. Uh, so I wonder if you can tell us some more about that. Okay. Professor Desai? You know, uh, I'm coming back to something I raised before, but I have to pursue this. Uh, Martin Nicholas was one person, and then uh, Baron Day of Calcutta was another person, who both said that after the, uh, after the failure of the Paris Commune, Marx became uh, convinced there is going to be no revolution in his time. So he began to explore other societies more as a as result of his disappointment. Uh, and exploring other societies on. But the main program had been, as it were, abandoned. Now, I know you, you told me that there were some improvements to volume two. But volume two, the way it is, it was written, and, and the way publishing, had nothing to do with other societies. It was to do with technical problem of, you know, longevity of capital, circuits of capital, mm -hmm. and so on. So I think this anthropology of other societies are utterly irrelevant to volume two or volume three. And the question is why was this going to be volume four or something? Uh, because it doesn't make any sense that this man has spent 16 years doing other things than finishing his book. <laughs> okay, um, here please. You, yeah? No, you wanted to speak? No. Okay, uh, then him, okay. Okay, uh, my question is also a question of only detail. Okay, I know that part two of Mega 2 contains Sorry. all the economic manuscripts connected to capital. So my question to uh, the professor is that does it contain all the drafts of capital volume two also, number one. Number two, has, is there any effort to try and bring it out in the English language? So please hear the micro here. Yeah, you have a micro, yeah? Oh, Please okay. start. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, and the last turn. See, I just have a small comment. I mean, one, one can be interested in Marx as a person and what he believed in, what he said, where he changed his mind or, and things of that nature. But, you know, there is a Marxism which seems to have a theory which explains now if, if you have a theory of history or, or development of history through technological development or whatever. Or, so my question basically is that when Marx is changing his mind about where the revolution could take place or only for Western Europe I was saying this and for other societies it could be something different etc. etc what kind of a Marxist theory we can fit that in so that we have a theoretical understanding of the change in uh, happening in Marxist understanding of things rather than or, or he is just leaving it open for us to do theorizing for him. Uh, that would be my main question. Yeah. Okay, please, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, thank you, Marcello. That was really fantastic. Um, a couple of things. Um, one is this uh, trendy notion of the move to the multilinear, which seems to me um, just completely anachronistic that the whole world should be going through a, a Marxian inspired industrialization project is a 20th century Stalinist preoccupation that's just foreign to the 19th century. It's foreign to Marx. 
he's talking about a revolution in Europe that of course would not require that every other society replicate the historical trajectory of Europe. If there was a socialist revolution in Europe, that would of course radically change the entire situation for world history. Um, so I'm really wondering if that's a valuable way to think. And in particular, this whipping boy of the 1853 writings on India. Yesterday I said these writings are on India, but they're not about it. And that's in part because when you look at the notebooks, and you look at, in a sense, the extension of the notebooks, which is all the newspapers he's writing about and he's digesting that we don't have anymore, but he certainly took notes on and are represented in those writings, he's talking about the debate in Europe. He's not talking about India. He's talking about the debate about investing in the railways. He's talking about the debate about the, uh, the possibility of growing cotton in India. He's talking about John Bright, the Manchester Liberals, and what they're saying in Parliament. And this whole you know, notion that Marx is saying that the British are a progressive force, all of it is to say, if liberalism could be extended into India in the way that the bright liberal, Manchester liberals say it could, then it would be, but he never believes that because he hates John Bright and he knows that John Bright is misleading the working class in Great Britain. So I, I really just find, you know, is, you know, is this really a, a, a valuable kind of lens? Because Marx already said that the, the present misery of the Hindu is that the old world has been destroyed and that no world, new world, is taking its place. That's exactly what he's saying in the 1870s, it seems to me, about Bar a bleeding process with a vengeance. Marcello, you have five minutes. For each of the questions, one minute. Yeah. But I really suggest to uh, the other um, speakers later to go there because you can listen to the question and not imagine the question. <laughs> because I've been here as a chair and, and it's, it's really difficult. frustrating because it's, really it's difficult, difficult to understand. Mm. So if this time I'm not answering, it's really because my fault and not because the voice did not arrive. Um, I will start from the last one. I will be extremely bad and superficial. We will talk later and I will take some of your questions like contribution to the uh, debate and some of the things that I said. Um, this question of multilinearity, etc., which I agree with you, it's a little bit irritating because too trendy today, but I want to say that this is something that Lawrence Crader already wrote in 1975. Some of the quotations, some of the things are his interpretation and he is saying that Marx is already starting this trajectory. So I will take this like a missed opportunity to look at this part of Marx much more than, for example, the early writings and these very old and stuffy debates that we still had and that you know, still makes Marx today for new generation because there are no anthologies or texts about this Marx, but you still, when you go in a bookstore and you're lucky to find a bookstore with books of Marx, then you will find these uh, early writing things. The same for India 1853. I quoted that one because it's one of the misrepresentations of Marx, in my opinion, and it's um, a very uh, like the idea of communism that I mentioned at the beginning. So, going back to the question of Peter Hoodes, the word history, the uh, extract, uh, excerpt on word history, they are available in Germany, in German, only for some 200 pages related to German history. And this is the most boring part. They are not available <laughs> in uh, English, they are not available in German, they are available in China. Why? Because in China there are 100 people in the Institute working the way that the Institute for Marxism-Leninism used to work in Moscow with 80 people and in Berlin with 40 at the time of the decifration of all this um, end writings of Marx. Uh, also the things about India, the notes on India, they were reprinted in an extremely obscure edition uh, by the University of Hawaii printed in 2001 in Honolulu. If you want to go there for vacation just with the excuse that you're going to buy the book, then it's something else. But I believe that it is very important to prepare anthologies, rigorous anthologies, in particular about this period of Marx's life after the international, because it is not possible to 
publish a book like this with you know hundreds of obscure pages that only few dozens of specialists can understand and perhaps enjoy but it would be very good to have anthologies very rigorously done so not anthologies that you take a sentence from 1844 then something from capital and then you go back to mark dissertation because you want to follow that path of, uh, of ideas right so an anthology of 150 to 100 pages well edited in which you can see the elaboration of the late Marx and people will have a lot of surprise about this. Going back to Professor Desai's question after the commune, I would say no. I say that Marx still has a very strong opinion and expectation about the working class movement, the party in Germany and in France. Two different ways, Marx is also a little bit chauvinist about Germany, but he's very happy and that's why he's writing the political program. He say a new socialist party is burning, finally it's no longer Proudhon. And the party in Germany is developing very quickly, it's getting already 9% of the votes before the, uh, Marx's wife died. So he's optimistic about this. It's not only that you know, in the West there is nothing to do, therefore there is only the possibility of something burning um, somewhere else. Um, the volume two, and actually you asked so many questions about this, the volume four, etc. how can I answer? I just want to say that yes, these anthropological studies, they belong to other preoccupations of Marx, and uh, I could not go into this, but I will talk to you later. But uh, as Koei Saito told us today, Marx elaborated the manuscript number eight about Capital Volume 2 in this period. Obviously, the thematic of Capital Volume 2 are less political, but there are two parallel studies, and beside these two parallel studies, there are all these disciplines and new research that Marx is taking. The question for Volume 4, and actually Volume 3, you didn't mention this, is even more complicated, because of book number three, there is only one draft of uh, 64, 65, and Marx is writing in a very optimistic way, then I will publish volume four, the history of the theory. But actually the history of the theory is the most incomplete one, because it was written only between 62 and 63, and only about one specific point, surplus value, I'm uh, close to the end. There is something available in English, again, I don't believe that we have to publish 15,000 pages in English to say, oh, now we know Marx, but but the question is anthologies or publication of significant parts of the preparation uh, uh, preparatory draft like for example did Fred Mosley a couple of years ago publishing for the first time in English the manuscript from 64 65 and then the final question revolution what kind of Marxist theory well if you read this Marx very carefully then you understand that you cannot simplify political issues in the interpretation of the society. For example, if you live in South America and there is the campesino, you cannot say that the campesino is the expression of the petite bourgeoisie. of Dalit is automatically uh, solved by the development of uh, f productive forces. There are specificities and in every page of the la late Marx you will always find his presence here while you're reading the book and Marx is telling you be very careful to historical circumstances. Analyze every fact with historical specificities. Well, thank you very much, Marcello. We are coming to an end for